Yo, that was sweet. You know, it's one thing to sing songs um, about how much we love him, and that's a good thing to do. We've done that today. It's another thing to sing about how much he loves us. Because that's where it starts, right? How he's blessed us. Everything, all of the Christian life is a response to what he's done for us. And so, hey, all of you, I've met first time guests here today who uh, early hour and this hour, all, all who are here, if you're not a member, we're so glad you're here today. And we hope that you have already been blessed to be here. We are, you can see, we're in this series called the, the Blessed Life. The Good Life is really the best translation probably. The Good Life belongs to these. And so we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. The hardest, most challenging sermon you'll ever hear. So uh, I'm just going to share what Jesus shares. That's what we do. And so we're just walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And just when we think he might just release us a little bit. Last week, we looked at the fact, we looked at all these um, antitheses. Okay, there's six of them that he goes through and says, okay, you've heard it said. Like the law says this, Ten Commandments. But... I say to you, and you can imagine all the Pharisees and all the religious leaders are like, the moment he says, but, they're going, hey, whoa, 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 where are you going with this? And so he goes back to the original intent of the law. And he says, I have come, all of those are in answer to this statement he makes, I've come to, uh, not to abolish it, not to get rid of the old covenant, if you will, but, but to fulfill it. So in him... He fulfills completely all that the law originally intended, and he lives out each commandment perfectly. We say it this way, Jesus is perfect theology embodied. So to be all that he's called us to be is to look just like him. And so if you're a guest, you wonder, what are we up to here? We are seeking to become like Jesus. In response to his grace, we are disciples. It's possible in our world today, and particularly in America, to claim a, a, that you're a Christian, to identify as a Christian and not be a disciple of Jesus. That's a problem. And so Jesus says, la last week, he finally gets to the end of the, of the six antitheses and he says, okay, so here's a summary statement. Um, he doubles down. Be perfect. Be perfect like, like your father's, in, you know, perfect. Be perfect like me. And we go, wait, What? And the word we said, teleos is the word, it means mature. So all of life, the whole plan and journey of life is to become mature like Jesus. This, this teleosity is what it is. One commentator, this isn't my new word. This teleosity of the whole Christian life is to move towards that end to become just like Jesus. That's what we're about. Isn't that why you're here today, right? To become just like him. You didn't come to watch a show or just simply hear me speak, but to to dive deeper into his word. And here's the question we're going to ask today. Now, we've talked about this. This has been a real tender kind of a series. We have identified people who we don't like much, uh, and we've sought to love them. We, we've uh, identified people that we've needed to forgive, who've hurt us. I mean, we've had some tender moments in here. And we've decided we're going we're gonna to obey Jesus and follow him because this is the good life. We've identified our lusts. And seeking to overcome those things, we've confessed our sin to one another. And today, the question he's going to ask us is this, what's your treasure? What is it that you treasure the most? And immediately, you, you might know, oh, I know where this is heading. I've, I've read this. It's in Matthew 6. Go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to Matthew 6, all right? Matthew 6, we're going to be in verses 19 through 24, and we are diving in. I hope you brought your Bible um, if you didn't, a lot of grace, but gang, this is the text for this class, all right? Bring your textbook. This is the one, and we're, we're reading it daily together in our dwell reading plan, so if you don't, don't get distracted, but if you want to look on your phone or something, uh, but if you have your journal, you can take notes as we do, because the way this is going to break down is um, whatever you treasure determines your trajectory in life. Whatever you treasure captures your attention. And whatever you treasure becomes your master. So we're going to unpack each of those. And th today, as we've talked about some hard topics today, and guests, you need to know this. Um, today, a lot. this is the context. A lot of this has to do with money, by the way. A lot of it. So we're going to talk about that a bit today. We don't always talk about that. Um, and some of us, you know, we're like, oh, I came on the wrong day. Ugh. You know, I mean, we talk like we're going to talk about money and we cringe a little bit in our spirit. 
That should tell us something right away, right? Even that we joke about it and such. Um, I'm one of these preachers, sorry, I don't mind talking about money because today is not what I want from you. It's never that. It's what I want for you. It's what Jesus <laughs> wants for you. And what he wants for us is to be released from the anxiety and the worry and the struggle that we all have with money. And, and so what we're trying to do is really, again, all of our guests, you, you know, our members know this. We just want to be completely obedient to Jesus as the master and Lord of our lives. That's what we're about. I started this series with a quote from a book um, called Dismissing Jesus. Uh, the most dangerous book I've ever read, apart from the Bible. It's by Douglas Jones, and, and in it he says this, the dominant form of Christianity is one designed to shield us from Jesus' explicit priorities. How is it that the vast majority of Christians set aside Jesus' obvious and revolutionary call so easily? How do we make disobedience and blindness so normal and acceptable? Whew. That's challenging, and I believe that is true. But I'm so grateful to pastor a church where we're going, no, come on, let's go. We want to give our lives to him fully. Give us the hard stuff. Let's see, get underneath it. What is he telling us? This one's going to be hard to digest. But what he's doing here, he's going to give us three focus points, really three analogies or word pictures in this one little passage. And all three are are telling us the same story from the same perspective. And it's this, watch this. He's going to talk about singularity of focus. That's what the whole, the, all three of these kind of analogies are that he's going to lay out for us, okay? So first, your treasure determines your trajectory. Y'all ready to dive in? We ready for this? Let's go. Come on. Y'all aren't nearly as hyped as I am. Okay, verse 19. You'll get there. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, verse 21, mark that one, there your heart will be also. We've talked about the heart. This is a comprehensive kind of holistic. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's the person, the whole person. That's where you'll go. Whatever you treasure. So the key question, and I want you to answer this question before we're done. What is your treasure? Now, some of you right away go, I know what it is. I've thought about this. I've thought deeply about this. It takes some work, though. So I'm going to offer some diagnostic questions throughout our entire message. And I want you to identify it. First way to overcome it is to name it. Then you can start dealing with it. Okay? So beware. Now, R.T. France, commentator, he says the better translation, when you look at the original language even, is not just do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but stop. Stop laying up treasures. Stop. And stop now. Stop today. Stop piling up treasure. But notice this in verse 20. He doesn't say don't store up treasures. Do store up treasures. What matters is the nature or location of the treasure. See, believers are to be storing up treasures. They were gonna, you could argue sin ahead of us or things that last forever. Why do we not do this? Why do we not store up treasure? Jesus tells us so. He tells us why. And in a word, here it is, kids, parents, forgive me. It's stupid. That's why. We don't say stupid in our house. Um, he says it doesn't last. It disappears. It evaporates. It vanishes over time. Why would you do that? It, it, you know, it's like you've heard before. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? You can't take it with you. Why would anyone invest in things that don't matter? Jesus, this is what he said. That's crazy. Instead, invest in things that will matter. All things that are eternal. Invest in the kingdom, the souls of men and women. Do, you know, love all of the things that Jesus is teaching us. But here's what's interesting. Moths and rust. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, I think this is the only place in the Bible we see moths, by the way. We see rust elsewhere. But, but these things have something in common. Uh, slow decay. Like you don't even really see it. What happens is there's this downward spiral. The insidious thing about this is, is that um, it's a progressive 
depreciation. You know this the moment you drive a car off the lot. Everything that you own is vanishing away. And it's eating away. And underneath it, the reason we can't do this is greed. In the end, I want what I want from me and I'm defining myself by the treasures around me and it's greed. I've talked about this before, but as a pastor, I have heard a lot of confession of sin. You can imagine. I mean, as, as, a, as a priest, I hear a lot of confession. Uh, I have someone to set up an appointment. This happens, you know, I just want to talk to you about something. I got to come get this off my chest. I, or often I've been found out or maybe not yet, but I got to tell somebody. Um, I've never had anyone come to my office and say, Jeff, here's why I set this up. I got a sin that's eating me alive. I am the greediest person I know. I've never had that happen. Now, someone may follow as a result of that, but um, I, I am, my sin is greed. And yet I have had couples, even single adults, come to me and say, Jeff, I need help. I'm, I'm over my head in debt like nobody's business, and it's crushing me. I have had that. A correlation? I've also had a young woman married with kids who, who decide, some years ago came and said, I, I, I need to tell you something. I got to confess this. She'd already been found out. But I can confess this. I've been racking up thousands of dollars on a credit card. My husband knows nothing about it. A correlation? You see, this, this comes to the heart of all of us. And this thing of greed and materialism, what Jesus calls mammon, we live and breathe in it. And this is a hard message to hear, but I'm going to hopefully help you and guide you here. What is your treasure? Now, me, me I'm good. that's mine. You know, we're running to materialism. Might be the best word, singular word, for mammon, but it's much larger than that. It's much bigger than that. The key question I want you to answer is, what is your treasure? How would you know? Well, where do you find, because maybe it's not money. Maybe you're like me, like, I don't care. I mean, sorry, I don't care a lot about my clothes. I don't care about my car or house or and material things aren't my thing. Might be, might be some of us. I've got my other things, right? But it might be what comes with it, status. Um, you treasure your, your safety. Some confessed that earlier today. Comfort that comes with it. You treasure your zip code, where you live, you're somebody, because you, you don't live over there, you live here. You, you know, it could be your performance, right? For a lot of us, it, it may be the approval of other people underneath a lot of that. What is it for you? I want you to name it. Another diagnostic uh, here is what, show me your habits, and I'll show you who you're becoming. That's your treasure. It points you to your treasure. It's why in Psalm 115, it says those who make idols become like them. Meaning, whatever you worship is shaping your life. You are being discipled by the thing that you treasure most. They become like them. They, you, you become whatever you worship. It forms you and shapes you. Jesus said, this is why he says later here in chapter 6, 633, Matthew 633. You ought to memorize this if you don't already. Anybody know? Seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And really, you could say everything else will find its rightful place. You'll have love in order. But he says, seek first the kingdom of God. You have one, one first. We've talked about this often. The word priorities, you do an etymology on the word, it's a new word. There's no such thing. It doesn't make sense. And that's what we're trying to see. Oh, I got these priorities, I got this, I got work, I got my family, I got all this stuff, I got my things, I got, oh, I got all my stuff, I'm trying to deal. I'm gonna, and, and we don't have one first. We don't have one singular, expulsive, kind of eliminating power of affection that puts everything else in its place. And that's what the Lord's calling us to. To give everything we have to him and set him as the, the, the source, the one who is our treasure. And until he is your treasure, friend, you will continue to live a scattered, anxious life. And, and, and what he's calling us to is, to, is, to, is to 
It's not, and not, not, not for him. Like, well, Lord, we'll make you treasure, you know, our treasure. Aren't you glad? We're going to lift you up and hopefully you'll get there. No, no, he's doing it for us, right? It's for our good. And, and so we pursue him because there's only one first. What is first? What's the treasure in your life? For most of us, we are pursuing him and we do want him to be the treasure of our lives. But he never talked about balance. He talked about pursuing one thing in life. And we all know this intuitively that this is the way to live, right? He's talking about singular allegiance again. So how do you know? These are the questions we always ask, need to ask when you're looking at scripture. Um, okay, he's challenging me to do this. How would I know? Again, this is what I'm, I'm getting us to and what I'm you know, praying and, and the Spirit's leading you. How would I know what my treasure is? Another diagnostic exercise. Whatever is your master, whatever is that you think you can't live without, how about this? If that thing were taken away from you, you would wonder if you even want to live anymore. Now it gets real tender. Because often our God things are really good things that we've made. First things. Uh, your children are not your treasure. And if they are, you're going to crush them. Your spouse, not your treasure. Yeah, I mean, your husband may be awesome. He's not Jesus. <laughs> your wife may be incredible. Not God. Your friends, your parents. I mean, you're, right? You're, you see how this plays out. And here's another. We've talked about this before. Another diagnostic question. Your deepest emotions will point you to your idol. What makes you Fearful. Gosh, we're seeing a lot of that in our day. Fearful of something we're going to lose. Then fear leads to anger. And I've shared this publicly where I have this ambient, you know, frustration sometimes. And I realize, ah, oh, it's because I'm, I want my thing to, you know, or, or something didn't happen today. It got in my way. And I wanted, I want to be this amazing pastor. And I just, and usually I realize, I confess this to someone this morning. Usually, no, usually I'm mad at myself. Like, I'm not doing what I, what I know how to do. So what is it for you? Again, you could, you could flip that too. You know, what, what makes you angry? What makes you fearful? What makes, you could flip it. What makes you really happy? Like you can't live without that thing. Like how lame is this? Your football team won yesterday. You're feeling really good today because of, of some 20-something-year-old guys ran around on the field <laughs> better than the other guys. That's nuts. Cowboys are crushing idols this season. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, no, love that. Um, another thing we've noted, uh, again, your habits, will, 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 your, your habits will show you. Your treasures determine your trajectory in life. Uh, this too can be, um, can be diagnostic. Okay, here it is. If it's money or mammon in some form for all. And mammon, mammon is a system. We'll talk about this in a minute. It is a, it's a system of prestige and power and possessions. It's all that. I mean, it's wrapped up in the, in the, the rich young ruler. Okay, he was worshiping mammon, which is the only God and idol that Jesus names by name, by the way. And I think mammon's the best non-translation to transliteration. We'll get there in a moment. But those of us who worship mammon, we need to step back and say, okay, how can I be released from money? There's one simple way that you know if, 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 if mammon, if money has you gripped and has a hold of you and it's a treasure, you know how? How about this? I'll flip that. How do you know if it's not? You tracking with me? You're a giver. That is how you know. If you're not a giver, it's got a grip on you. Right? Because you're like, I can't release it. I can't. I lose some of me if I give this away. I, I'm holding this because I, it, it, it defines me. I'm losing some personhood if I give this away. You see how insidious and crazy this is? It grabs us. And, and, it, and it's hard for us to release. And, and so some of us here in our right minds in a worship setting like this, I think all of us were like, yeah, I want to be more generous. This is, oh, pastor talking about money. I want to, I want to, what can I do? I'm glad you asked. Um, 
because I want to help you. Get out of the mess that you're in. I'm your guy, all right? Some of our members know this. I am a financial expert, and I want to offer this. Here's my advice. Spend less money than you make over a long period of time, you're going to be okay. <laughs> That's free. That's just... I mean, people pay thousands of dollars to get that kind of advice. <laughs> um, why can't we do that? Greed? Again, not, not greedy. I'm not... Mm. Why can we not get this right? And, and, you know, some of us grew up learning about um, tithing, the 10% tithe. Why can't we do that? Doesn't it seem, okay, one out of 10, just the tithe. And the tithe, by the way, for the Christian is not the standard. It's not the baseline. It's training wheels. The standard is the cross. The baseline is the cross. Jesus did not give 10%. Aren't you grateful he didn't just give 10%? He gave everything he had so that we could give everything we have. And you say, well, Jeff, what does that look like? Give, give everything away? I'm just going to be poor like homeless? He says, hey, here's the starting point. Give, give a percentage, and I challenge all of it. Be a percentage giver. Move up to 10%. You can determine what that is. A lot of us have it just drawn from our, our bank account straight into the church, straight to the church. You can bring it every week, but be determined to go ahead. And many of you have done this, so I'm, I'm praising the Lord for, this, for you. Now, again, not because you're giving to me. This is what I want for you to be released. And the way to do this is to give first because first says you're the one and everything else has its rightful place. And then Jesus, watch this. He, he, the Lord says, give, give 10%. And again, I'm, there's fuzzy edges on that. And, and I know that sounds legalistic. Why can we not do that? And then the, re, the other nine, he says, that's yours, have at it. Just do, follow me to my glory, spend to, to my glory, go. Why can't we do that? Greed. And some of you say, Jeff, I don't know that I'm greedy. I'm just strapped. Mm, you got over, over your head, right? So you're paying on all these things, and here's what I want to do. I want to offer some practical teaching, okay? Here's another. This is free stuff. This is amazing. Um, this, I want to offer this. Five things you can do with your money. I've taught this before. I stole this from Andy Stanley some years ago, and Stacy and I have, have practiced this, and it's, this is gold. What can you do with your money? Think about th certain things you can do with your money. You can spend it, right? You can do that. You can repay debt what a lot of us do, and intentionally repay. You're paying again. Repay debt. Uh, you can pay taxes. You better pay taxes, all right? Some of us are giving to Caesar and not to the Lord, by the way. That's whacked. Anyway, um, fourth, save it. That's a good thing. I suppose you could say invest it, so that would be maybe that as well, if you can. And then, oh, oh, you can give it. You can give it, too. You can give money away. So here's the flip-flop. Watch this. This is the finance. Some of y'all ought to be writing this down. Um, first of all, watch this. Here's the flip. The order I just offered, right, is what we do. Spend it, and then we wrestle the rest of the time. Give it first, right? It sets everything. It, like, Lord, everything I have is yours, so I'm acknowledging that from the start. With this paycheck, I am giving right, this right here. Then, then save it. Then pay taxes. Or you could flip this. No, get rid of your debt. And yeah, pay the taxes because they're coming after you if you don't. Um, do all that. And then, and then fifth, spend it. And I know some of us are like, I'd have nothing to spend. Uh, no, you probably wouldn't get that $8 coffee. You know, probably, maybe. And I know that this really does step on some toes. But it's because I love you. And I want all of our members to be set free. We are a generous church. It's amazing. But I want to encourage you, and encourage all of us, even in this season, Rodney mentioned it earlier, that you'd be a giver, that you would go above and beyond your regular giving to the unified budget, and that you would give to our capital projects, like the sanctuary. You could be a part of that. I mean, to be a part of this historic, what's going to be, I mean, already one of the most amazing, beautiful rooms in all of Dallas. It's going to be more beautiful than it's ever been. It's incredible. And you can say, I, I, I was a part of that. 
This is my church. I mean, we voted on this, every one of us. So we're, I mean, as a church family. So we are in on this. And of course, it's not just money. You know this. It's about serving. It's about giving your time. I mean, some of us have a hard time giving up our time. Like, I'm not going to serve that person. I got my own time, right? And some of us need to be serving here. Come here ready to serve and love others. Spend a lot of time on that first point. Now let's move. Okay, y'all can take a deep breath, but not yet. Um, Your treasure captures your attention. I mean, we're still wondering, okay, what is your treasure? What, what, in a word, what would you say it is? Look at this. This seems like a non sequitur, this next portion, because it doesn't seem to follow. Look at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, okay, now this is, I want you, I want to geek out with me for a minute. The word healthy can also be translated good. In fact, other translation, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Now this is interesting. But if your eye is bad, some translations say evil. Other translations point out that this means greedy. Your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is or in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now there's, this is a little strange to us. We get it that light has something to do with seeing, but he's saying the light that's coming into you is, is, is your whole, your whole life is light and it impacts your life, the kind of light you have. If we, we all know if we go to a, into a room, like a pitch black room, we're all blind because you have to have light to see. Um, light and life is tied together in the scriptures. In fact, in first, first John uh, chapter one, verse four, it says in, in him was life. You remember this? And, and he was the light of men. He's the source of, And he is the one that shows us how to see the world rightly when we're filled with the spirit. We have the mind of Christ. You can say we have the eyes of Christ. I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's famous quote when when he said, I believe in the sun, not not simply because I or the sun is risen, not simply because I've seen it. By it, I can see everything else. That's the Christian life. That's living in the kingdom. We see the world differently. We see people differently. But what's happening here, two words, this is where I want you to geek out with me for a minute. Um, there's two words here that, that he's, I think Jesus is offering a, and each word has, has a double meaning. And he's, it's playing on words. So what he's saying is this. The first word is haplous. It's the word healthy. Okay. Haplous in verse 22, it refers to singleness. A focus, you see? So we get that too, eyes, focus, okay. But it also means this focus means it means integrity or wholeness, okay? And it's up against, haplous is is the antonym, the opposite of of diplous is the word in the Greek. We get our word duplicity. So you see where that goes? We we might say in this case, double double vision, blurry. You're you're duplicitous, you're you're distracted. So one is good and healthy, and the other, poneros, okay, is the word that actually means bad or, look at this, like the other. It has this, this, um, this physical, okay, meaning, but also an ethical meaning. Bad, that's why it's translated evil. So it really means good, okay, and generous up against evil, and watch this, greedy, this is what Jesus is talking about here. This is why it helps to get into the languages at times. And, and what he's saying is this. We've said it before. Attention, your focus is the beginning of your devotion. Whatever you're focused on will reveal who your, who your treasure is, what your treasure is. Uh, Taylor Lowry pointed this out we were talking about this week. Um, he was saying, you know, you can look on, our, our youth, youth pastor would know this, look on your phone or the algorithms that are chasing you down, like all the ads that show up. Oh, that's what you're focused on. You do a search and, oh, look at those pictures that are, that are coming in. That's where my mind is. You see how that works? They're chasing you down and showing what you focus on because whatever you focus on will lead you forward. It's, it's guiding the trajectory of your life and whatever you focus on, whatever captures your attention is your treasure. So what the Lord wants us to see here is this pursuit of mammon that he'll get to in a moment makes us blind. 
Like we, we don't see the world as we should. You ever notice, I've, I've noticed this, really rich people, they, they not only feel that they're financially superior to people, they feel they're superior to people. And, and we do this too, where we, how about this? When you, this will reveal something to us, when you see someone who's wealthy or you, you, you hold them in high regard because they have a lot of money. You see someone who's poor and you don't, you hold them in contempt. A person in the kingdom would say, I love you, rich person, for who you are, not for what you have. And wow, how they need that. And poor person, I love you, and I honor you. A kingdom person sees everybody the same. Because watch this, once we get to heaven on the new earth, and we're celebrating, worshiping the lamb who was slain for us, there are no poor neighborhoods and there are no rich neighborhoods. There's no zoning of people out. Listen, the pursuit of mammon makes us blind. We want to remove poor people. We don't want to see them. Probably because of the guilt factor. I don't know. Maybe, no, I just want to be around people like me. In heaven, watch this. There's no redlining. There's no zoning. Everybody, poor, wealthy, everybody, black, white, all people, are worshiping the lamb who was slain and we've all determined he is the treasure. He's the only one. When we see him face to face, we will become like him and we will worship him with everything we've got. It's why I loved in our dwell reading, I think it was last week in Proverbs, it said, this is a great prayer. Proverbs says, um, Lord, don't make me rich, but don't make me poor. Let me live right in the sweet spot. And for some of you, uh, given 10% would not be a sacrifice at all. And, and, and the Lord is, uh, I trust, convicting you. But I'm so grateful that I'm a part of a church today, you're a part of a church that is serving in the poorest places in our city. We have opportunities coming up for Thanksgiving, but I, I'm so grateful that we're in Bachman Lake where places like Victory and South Dallas, we are down at the border where every, all the politicians are arguing about what's happening there. We are there serving people. And we're going to continue to do that. I praise God that we're part of a church like that. Okay, so your treasure, let's land this. Determines your trajectory, your treasure, uh, you know, captures your attention. And then finally, your treasure becomes your master. No one can serve two masters, he says. You see that he's back to this, not duplicity, but focus, right? A singular focus. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, the word translated money there is the word mammon. I think it's better left mammon. I think maybe the King James says it that way. Mammon is actually a transliterated word, meaning it's come straight from the Aramaic, which is Jesus' language. This is a word he would have said, mammon. And again, it's the one idol that he identifies. Mammon is this system of greed. And, and Jesus identifies it as, watch this, the number one opposition against the kingdom of God is mammon. This is also, it makes it hard to translate it because it's also a hapax legomena. It is. I'm not making this up. That's a word that shows up only once in the whole Bible. And so you go, wait, what does that mean? We don't have other passages or verses to say. That's what it means, I think. We see a pattern here. Um, but mammon is, is an opposition and this is so hard for us because this is the air we breathe. We live in this world, a lot of us in North Dallas. So, again, good things become God things. We treasure those things that capture our hearts and our attention, and you've now identified yours by the Spirit of God. You can continue to think deeply about this, but I wonder, what, what would it be, the one thing? Like in a word, if you were to name it. This is so important because it doesn't stop here. Anytime we treasure something, we give our lives to it. That's the point. This is so, so powerful. What Jesus is saying, here, here's the thing. Treasures are going to demand everything from you. Whatever you treasure. And it may be something that you long and wish that you had. And it consumes you. It's not even something you have. It's a new improved you or it's another thing or phase of your life. 
treasure, watch this. Here's what happens. Treasures will say, die for me. Your treasure says, die for me. And Jesus says, I've already died for you. I will be your treasure and I will not crush you. Jesus is the only treasure that will not require everything from you and ultimately crush you. It's why today we come to a point in the service where I want us to have a time of commitment and devotion to the Lord, okay? So our, our, our band's gonna come out. We got time to do this. We've made time in the service for no one to, to rush out. We are seeking to respond before we go because you won't have another moment like this with the body of Christ this week, perhaps. So we're going to close our time. I know this has been a hard message to hear, hard one to preach, hard one to apply. But if Jesus is your one first, the one explosive eliminating affection in your life, then you'll be set free. So what do we do? Well, first you name it. And that's what we're going to do today. You don't have to do this, of course, but we've done it in all of our services and I'm going to challenge you to say it. There's something powerful about saying it out loud. And just in a word. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to explain it. You can just say, here it is. This is mine. And we're going to do that in a minute. We're going to literally, we're going to stand and find someone and you're already a little nervous. I don't know anybody around me. Hey, you know what? Maybe you'd find someone, they'd be a safe person. <laughs> you don't know them. They're a brother or sister in the Lord. Maybe you're with family or friend. And you can say, yeah, here's where I'm prone to run. I just want to say it out loud. I'll go first. Most of y'all know me well enough. I so want to be a great pastor for you. I want to be the pastor you deserve to have. And I'm not. And so I'm always wrestling with that. And I can tell that because when I, you know, oh, I crushed it today. I'm feeling great. Yeah, people like me. And oh, I'm horrible. Oh my gosh, they're coming after me. You know, and my life can be like this. And underneath that, I think, is this, this challenge of, of seeking the approval, you know, of people when all I want, I just want his approval in my life. That's all I want. And I'm so grateful for how he's working in my life uh, to get there. But I know it's when I focus on him, Lord, you're the treasure of my life. You're so far above anything else. Everything else starts to drift away, you know? The opinions of others or disapproval, it doesn't. It doesn't have a hold on me. And so I don't know what it is for you, but we're going to, I'm going to just pray. And then we're going to stand up and find someone and just say, yeah, here it is for me. And then we're going to sing together, okay? So let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the word you've given us today. I thank you that you have spoken to us about the, the way that our treasures set the trajectory of our lives. We see it. We know it. Our treasures capture our attention and we focus, hyper-focus on things that we've made our gods, our idols. And we see it, Lord. Our treasure becomes our master and demands everything from us. Thank you that you are the ultimate treasure and you're teaching us how to love you and worship you with our lives. So as we do what the scripture says to confess our sin to one another, I pray that you'll move mightily now and it would set uh, us on a new path. So Lord, we love you. We give you our lives in Christ's name. Amen.